Today, we have a special conversation with Premier Andrew Fury. Premier Fury was born and raised in Newfoundland and Labrador. And prior to taking the helm as our 14th Premier in the province, he was known as Dr. Andrew Fury and has had a heralded career as an orthopedic trauma surgeon and educator with Memorial University's School of Medicine. Now, he completed his trauma training at the world-renowned John Hopkins University, and he also holds a diploma in organizational leadership from Oxford University. His career in medicine and dedication to charitable work has earned him a lot of awards on the provincial and national levels, and these honors include the Humanitarian of the Year by the Canadian Red Cross and the Governor General of Canada's Meritus Service Cross. I called him at his office in the Confederation Building to talk about a variety of topics that relate to his work as the Premier, but also his approach towards health and wellness, both personally and professionally. In the first part of our conversation, we talked about his work helping those in the developing world, including Haiti and Bangladesh, with Team Broken Earth, much of which was captured in his new book called Hope in the Balance, A Newfoundland Doctor Meets a World in Crisis. As we'll hear, these experiences have helped define him as a person, family man, and a leader. We'll also discuss the challenges for health we face as a province, including how we stack up to the rest of Canada in terms of our health as a population, and more importantly, what we need to do to improve it. On a personal note, I've known the Premier for nearly a decade and can attest that he takes his own health very seriously and commits to regular exercise and a healthy eating regimen. We'll dive into how he addresses his own personal health habits and stays fit with a hectic schedule. And lastly, what's on everybody's mind, we'll discuss the COVID-19 pandemic and the recent changes to the Atlantic bubble, why we need to still adhere to public health measures, and what's the latest news on the potential for a vaccine. So, when you get the opportunity to interview the Premier, you ask a lot of questions, so we got a lot to cover. Let's listen in. Welcome to the show, Premier Fury. Hey, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Today we're chatting about health. It's a health and wellness show. But one of the things I want to really dig into today is the very unique perspective you bring to the table, being a physician and being the premier of, of Newfoundland and Labrador. Give me a bit of a background on your path, you know, through a physician and then to the Confederation Building career-wise. <laughs> well, that's very uh, open-ended and long question, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, so sure. You know, I mean, you know. Uh, I always uh, wanted to, to give back. I always wanted to help people. Uh, I was drawn to medicine, not just for the academic pursuit and, and the quest of curiosity, but also uh, probably more importantly towards the empathetic altruistic draw to, to help people. And um, I, was re I think that comes from a, a family history of, of public service and rising to challenges and I was quite happy in that role and, and loved all my patients and, and, and got quite a, a bit of, uh, of self and fulfillment and professional fulfillment from that role. But I always wanted to, to felt a draw to, to do more. And, and of course that started, that was the impetus for uh, broken earth and, and giving back using our skills and, our good fortune here uh, in Canada and in Newfoundland and Labrador to distribute that around the world to try to address some of the inequities that exist elsewhere in our small way. And, uh, you know, and then that, uh, of course, led to the further call of public service when, uh, when I saw the challenging times that Newfoundland and Labrador uh, is facing and we're all currently facing, whether it be uh, the fiscal crisis, the demographic crisis, or the current public health crisis, uh, we're in, a, we're in a, 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 a dark spot, but, you know, you can either put the helmet on and, and, and go downstairs in your basement and, and hope that it all ends, or you can see this time of disruption as, 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 as a potential to reinvent and reimagine uh, Newfoundland and Labrador for the future. And, and I saw this as, a, as an opportunity to contribute. People always ask me why I would do it now, and, and the answer is, is generally quite simple. It's because I need to be able to look my children in the eye and, and in 10 years and 20 years from now and, and tell them that I did everything that I could during what's arguably Newfoundland and Labrador's darkest hour. Um, so, I mean, that's a, 
that's a kind of succinct uh, path to where we, mm -hmm. to where we are today. But uh, I'm happy to expand on, on, on any element of those. Well, I, I think that you said something about helping when things are dark. Your book is really a collection of stories about how you became a physician and some of the stories about being in Haiti and operating on somebody in a dark room uh, when, a, when a secondary earthquake kind of hits and, and there's dust and everything else going around there. Like, um, how did those experiences change you as a physician? Uh, well, the first trip to Haiti... Uh, it changed me as a as a physician, as a husband, as a father, and and, and genuinely as a as a as a person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I say in the book, and it's true. You know, uh, global health was never on my radar. Um, it was not something you know that uh, I I pursued in medical school, and although my colleagues did, and some of my colleagues did, and I, I look, I was their biggest champion and, and cheerleader, but. It was just not something that wasn't on my chip. And then uh, when I saw the, the earthquake in Haiti, I was compelled to act partially because of my trauma training. But when I was there, it was, uh, it was life changing. It was a life altering. It was a combination of, of professional, spiritual, uh, personal, political movement inside that really made me realize that stuff that we probably all know that, but it's not in our frontal lobe every day is that how lucky we are to have been born in Canada and, and live in Newfoundland and Labrador and, and reap the benefits of those who have walked before us. But we do so, uh, when we do so, we carry a sense of responsibility that also has to be displayed on a, on a global stage. And, and, and being, being in Haiti in the ruins of the earthquake made me recognize that, that Canada and the fortune that, uh, that we've been blessed with has a responsibility to play to help those less fortunate around the, around the world. You know, personally, it, it, it changed me as well in that, you know, you're, you're standing in this kind of collapsed hospital and, and it really <laughs> looked like all hope could be lost, yet there were small patient interactions, uh, including a, a young girl who was looking after her grandfather whose hip we fixed. And despite the chaos, despite the rubble, despite the overwhelming gravity of the situation, you could see in, in this young girl's eyes some hope for a better future uh, for Port-au-Prince and for Haiti. And, um, you know, she looking in her eyes really uh, changed my life as well, because even in the darkest of times and the in the belly of a uh, rubble hospital, there was this hope and, and, you know, I don't subscribe to the, to the notion that, uh, you know, hope is no strategy. I, I don't, you know, that may be a, a quick sound bite, but, you know, hope should be a, a fundamental input of any strategy. It may not be a strategy in isolation, but strategy without hope is no strategy at all. And likely the, the efforts were all because you believed you could make a difference as well. And that's part of the, it goes hand to hand with hope. Yeah, of course. And, you know, but you don't have to be a doctor uh, to, uh, to make a difference in your own communities. And I think part of it is, is just realizing that, you know, we're all in this together, right? And, and the fundamental uh, premise that one of, you know, not to get too spiritual in any, but mm. <laughs> one of the kind of goals of life should be just as simple as leave the place a little better than you found it. Right. And uh, if, you know, everyone everyone believes in that then ultimately think the place will be better was there was there any chapter in that book that really stood out to you i i thought it was really interesting when you started traveling to bangladesh because you would network with a different group of people when you were doing your postgraduate work but what was something that really stood out as a different sort of thing oh uh, bangladesh was a you know completely different you know dhaka has a a population density. I may be off by a little bit here, but I think almost like ten times or eight times or something the population density of New York City. You know, it's, a, it's one. It's a true mega city uh, with, uh, and and comes with its own issues. Obviously, so first of all, you're kind of overwhelmed with just the mass of humanity, and you know I think it's something that we all, uh, or certainly uh, some of us, think about uh, in that you know, the world, how the world's population is distributed. And it's easy, I think, sitting in the comfort of North America and watching North American TV to, 
to forget that we represent a small portion of the world's population. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it kind of hit you immediately in, in Bangladesh. Um, but then outside of that, then you, you really saw that this was a, a developing country that had its, you know, there was no earthquake, but it equally was uh, struggling to develop and catch up to the rest of the developed world like, uh, like Haiti. The parallels aren't always obvious, but the ones that are are generally related towards the low income scenario and, and seeing a population trying to uh, reach the next uh, income bracket, if you will. We all talk about, you know, in North America growing the middle class on a global stage, the low middle, the low middle income countries are trying to get to the, to the next rung as well. And you could, you could sense that in, in Bangladesh, they, the people there were absolutely uh, spectacular, uh, amazing. And, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, I guess one of the, one of the trips that uh, also trained, changed me within Bangladesh was going to the Rohingyan refugee camps and, and seeing this, this massive population who have been displaced from their homes and living in, uh, in tents and temporary structures and it, you know, as I'm describing this, I'm sure you and your listeners are thinking like it's a collection of tents or probably the size of a small campsite. There's millions of people, you know, wow. in, in a temporary uh, space that had, because of, you know, just normal human behavior and, and, and sociological development that were, or was organized into grids and you could see commerce yet, you know, these people had been chased from their homes and were living in uh, in these temporary shelters. That was quite moving and, uh, and quite powerful to kind of look out and all you could see, be, you know, hill beyond hill was covered in tents. And, and this was definitively temporary because the year before, these were all green, lush, rolling hills. Uh, quite, you know, quite, quite, quite moving and, 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 uh, and really struck a chord with me. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to the Far East, I realized I was on planet Earth because a, yeah. a, a huge proportion of the population live very, very differently we do here. And I guess that would yeah, be... Just yeah. to, before we leave that, like yeah. I really, you know, not to, should be promoting my own book, but I'm not. I'm going to promote uh, this book called Factfulness that I really encourage your listeners to uh, to pick up and read. It, it It's definitely a, a timely book, even though it's a few years old now, but it, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of concentrate on the negatives in life, but mm. And, that, and to reminisce romantically about, oh, how 20 years, was, was be 20 years ago was better than we are today. It's actually not true. Um, and if you kind of look at the, you know, you look at it objectively, and, and this, this book helps, us, helps you do that. Um, it's, it's a really uh, quick, easy read to uh, really reset your frame of reference, especially in, uh, in what you can, in sometimes like these, you can only kind of see the negatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things like quality of life and life expectancy and treatment for yeah, yeah you know uh, neonatal you know life expectancy maternal fatality uh, neonatal you know pediatric uh, mortality rates uh, all of these things are improving on a right. global stage you know like you know globally children are living longer and that's mm. and that's fantastic and it's something that you should we should celebrate but it's also something that it creeps and so you don't kind of you know there's there's no postage stamp necessarily with that statistic, right? Right. Um, but it, this factfulness book is, is is fantastic. It's an easy read. I think it, I'm encouraging my children to read it as well. You know, although everything is important, obviously locally, but it also kind of gives you a, a a bigger frame of reference sometimes, which in, in, especially in today's day and age, it, it sometimes uh, you lose sight of. And I mean, it's not just me. I think. Uh, could be mistaken but i think warren buffett uh, was so attracted to this book he uh, he bought it for all the high school graduates in nebraska one year wow we're talking with premier andrew fury about health and wellness in our province and his experiences working as a physician in the developing world if you want to learn more you can pick up his new book hope in the balance a newfoundland doctor meets a world in crisis i already picked up my hard copy here locally but there's also an ebook available online now we're going to jump to a break, but when we come back, we'll talk about the state of health here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Welcome back. We're here with Premier Andrew Fury talking about health and wellness here at home in Newfoundland and Labrador. Let's get back to our conversation. So we know that obviously in other parts of the world where you've traveled and done medicine, things are very, very different. But 
yeah, here at home, we've got our own specific challenges. What are some of the challenges that Newfoundlanders face in the province when it comes to healthcare? Well, you know, Newfoundland and Labrador face this tremendous challenge in, in, uh, in healthcare. It's no secret. We uh, spend the most money per capita on healthcare out of any province. And as I've said many times, look, if we were all living to be 120 and playing tennis and had active, healthy lifestyles, then by any stretch, that is a good return on investment of those healthcare dollars. Mm. Unfortunately, the reality is the exact opposite. We're spending the most per person per year on healthcare in Canada, yet we have the highest burden of disease, the lowest life expectancy, and some of the lowest quality of life in our senior years. So there represents not just a, uh, an economic challenge, but an, an incredible social challenge as well. So what we need to do is figure out a way to, uh, to reinvest and invest in the social determinants of health. Mm. So things like active, healthy living, smoking cessation, uh, exercise. Uh, these are the things that we need to be encouraging and teaching our, our children so that they develop and grow into active, healthy lifestyles, and then that will pay a dividend down the road. That's an economic equation that plays out over time. There's no question about that. But if you don't plant the seed for the tree, it will never grow. And we need to figure out how to do that now so that future generations do not carry both the economic and the uh, health burden that our uh, current aging uh, population carries. Yeah, I, I, I agree that 1000%. I grew up in an active household. Uh, it just was second nature to me. But I think that a lot of people don't realize what they should be doing. What are some things you hope to accomplish as the, as the premier then when it comes to removing these barriers to better health? Yeah, I think we need to uh, figure out how to, and, and I'm quite happy uh, that Dr. Parfrey and Sister Elizabeth have, uh, have stepped up uh, to help in this respect, but to figure out if fundamentally is our health system meeting the needs of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians because we can't we critically haven't looked at that in quite some time arguably since the uh, introduction of Medicare mm -hmm. so more than just the brick and mortar of you know where hospital ex exists are, are we providing the services uh, that are required of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and equally are we motivating incentivizing appropriately for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to be uh, more active and more healthy, whether that's through other, and other jurisdictions have done this, you know, with fitness tax credits, uh, simple things, but also making sure, you know, that an investment in a, in a recreational uh, facility is not just an investment for the municipality or, or uh, you know, for the local business community. It can be an investment in people's future in terms of healthcare. So providing safe walking spaces, uh, providing opportunities that uh, children can, uh, can skate, can play basketball, can be afforded the, the option to, to, uh, to partake in active healthy living, I think is, is something that we need to critically look at to ensure that they are having opportunities uh, so that we, this again is all you know planting the seed so that they live with less of a burden of disease and hopefully longer than the generation before them. That's right. Well, one of those social determinants of health is, is uh, money to be able to pay for sports. And if there's a community center or something that allows people to get exercise in an affordable way, that's something that will help them and remove that barrier, which is a huge hurdle for people. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it's specific, like in the rural areas, what are some things that the people in the rural Newfoundland that we can do, you think, to, to help promote their, their own health when they may not have access to some of the same benefits and facilities that you might see in larger urban centers? Yeah, so I think, you know, that always remains a challenge, and that's a challenge of our geography and a challenge of our history. But as we are kind of emerging from this pandemic, we've also seen the value of, uh, of uh, virtual programs, whether it's in delivering uh, services like healthcare, but can also be extended to recreation. I'm also very impressed as I drive around the province about how municipalities have cooperated to pool funds so that their combined municipalities, even though you know, you're, you're not amalgamating anything, they're pooling funds towards a common recreational facility, mm. which re you generally reflects the communities that they serve, I think, which is brilliant. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's no need to create two hockey rinks a, a stone throws apart when there's you know, when there's a couple of hundred children, you, you need to kind of pool resources to make sure they're being invested, in, invested appropriately. 
and I, I've been very impressed with how communities are cooperating uh, towards that. So looking at how to work together, but also how to be creative as with, uh, with virtual concepts and different styles of activities, I think it is, is, is quite good. I mean, we've seen, you know, how you don't always need a, a spin class uh, teacher now, right? You yes. know, you can have, a, you can have virtual uh, sessions for some of these communities, uh, buying a few spin bikes in a room with a screen and, and virtual setup is, is within their reach uh, and encourages a healthy, uh, active uh, participation and one which is good on your joints, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Well, we know with that. Yeah. And you know, virtual, we'll talk a little bit about your own personal fitness regime, because I know that's something that's really important to you, but I just put your physician hat back on for one second. How, how big of a role does somebody play in their own health outcomes? So somebody walks into your clinic, what's the difference between somebody who takes care of themselves when it comes to outcomes or somebody who really is looking to you for the answer? Yeah. I mean, it's quite, that's not an easy answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, everyone comes with their individual complexities and uh, and histories and social histories. And uh, but generally speaking, uh, the better lo you look after yourself, uh, uh, more than generally, I mean proven, mm -hmm. the better you look after yourself uh, in terms of healthy eating, active participating lifestyle, uh, the better your health outcomes are. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know things. Uh, Things done in moderation uh, combined with, again, an active, healthy lifestyle are important. So it, it's not rocket science, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As we all know, it's, uh, it, but again, I appreciate and understand the complexities of individuals when, when tackling some of these issues. So it's always important to be sensitive uh, to individual needs. And, uh, but as a general rule, uh, you know, the more active, healthy, uh, you are and the more healthy you eat and, uh, you know, you watch uh, the obesity is, is, is a real issue uh, for, for many. And I understand it's a struggle and uh, I'm very empathetic towards that. But it, obesity comes with a whole other uh, level of risk factors. Uh, and it's not, that, that's not Newfoundland, by the way. That, that's across yeah. North America, as we all know. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no judgment here to Newfoundland and Labrador in particular, but just as a, as a medical metric, um, it's one that, you know, we can certainly try to control, uh, whether it's it, watching, you know, calorie intake or meal size portions, uh, or, um, balancing that with calorie output, uh, mm -hmm. with a, a, an active, a healthy lifestyle. We're here with the premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, the honorable Dr. Andrew Fury. When we come back, we'll learn how he keeps healthy while balancing family and work. From roaming the regatta to regular workouts on the run, we'll find out how he tries to lead by example, especially when it comes to instilling the importance of health with his kids. We'll be right back. It could be his background as an orthopedic surgeon or as an athlete, but Premier Fury has kept up with his active lifestyle throughout his life. In this segment, he shares with us why he thinks staying healthy is so important for him, his family, and for all of us. Exercise has other benefits. It gives you lots of energy and allows you to focus. So let's talk about why is exercise such an important part of your life, given that you've got a busy career, obviously, a busy home life, you know, you're involved in a, in a million other activities. Uh, why is exercise and, and eating well important to you? Oh, exercise is key. Uh, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head uh, in a, you know, people think you, well, there's two components of it for me. One is, you know, you, you feel better, you feel fit. And there is that, you know, that internal reward for doing so, whether it's, you know, lifting more weight, running a little bit faster, rowing a little bit harder, uh, watching your times, there's that kind of internal motivation. But for me, as I'm getting a little bit older now, it's less about how much I can bench press and more about the mental health component of it. And, uh, and I really find that I get, I think clearer, I act more rational and my day is always better after a workout or run or row one of them, you know, one of them and trying to balance that with a, with a healthy diet is, uh, you know, all of those things feed into your mind and mm -hmm. it's, it's a balance of physical activity with the mental health rewards of it. 
So run me through what, I think it's always beneficial to hear what other people are doing, but what does your day look like when it comes to healthy living? Yeah, so I uh, generally try to, if you have, this has changed dramatically mm -hmm. since COVID, obviously, but, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and frankly, it's changed even in the last five years. Five years ago, had you asked, I would have been at the gym three to four times a week, uh, less cardio, more strength training, um, and now I've flipped into a uh, kind of circuit training uh, piece in the morning, generally three to four times a week. And uh, layered on top of that, I try to run uh, five times a week. The, the real reason, I'm, I'm not a great runner. My frame is too big. But, um, but the reason I've kind of flipped to running over the last two years, in, two or three years in particular, I always ran a little bit, but I've been kind of concentrated at, you know, five times a week for the last couple of years, three years maybe, is it's, it, it's mobile. All you need is sneakers and, and a headset and away you go. Mm -hmm. So with the level of traveling that I was doing before this job, it was certainly uh, more versatile. But the rowing, you know, I've rowed in the regatta a couple of times and still we still have a uh, rowing group that sends out workouts. So I try to kind of do a different balance, whereas, you know, five years ago, it's kind of more strength training. And then, you know, I try as much as I can to get to hockey once a week as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I try to knock all that off in the morning, you know, before the day starts. I really find even before the, the chaos of this current job uh, that, you know, your days don't become yourself, even... In, even when it was a bit more predictable of a, a schedule, starting out the morning at 5.30, 6 a.m. with a run or a workout or a row really, uh, really sets you up for, for a better mental health space in, in tackling the rest of your day. Yeah, you've tended to choose careers that require decision making. So having a good, <laughs> clear head going into the day is not a not a bad thing. Okay, let's talk about you mentioned it before about uh, about communities having access. The world is now opened up in fitness. You do some virtual workouts. You know, you could get on Skype and you can get a workout in uh, a, with a couple of dumbbells. Is that still effective? Yeah, specific. Yeah, no, no, I found it great. Um, so in the morning. Uh, you know, uh, myself, my training partner, uh -huh, will uh, kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, get on FaceTime uh, it, what I, and uh, work out together doing circuits. And I've been amazed because when the gym's closed, what you can accomplish with, uh, you know, a 50-pound dumbbell, a 30-pound dumbbell, and, uh, and really that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, doing a combination of core, squats, uh, arms, dips. I've managed to turn a really small space into a pretty efficient gym. And I got to tell you, waking up at, you know, 5, 10, as opposed, with no travel time, no commute, uh, adds another layer of benefit to it because, uh, you know, oftentimes I can finish the workout and then see the kids before they go to school, which mm. before going to the gym, I generally meet my workout partner at 6. And... Um, and then go straight to work after that. Yeah. Um, so there, this virtual workout, I was a bit skeptical at first, but yeah. I quite enjoy it now. And it, and it allows some uh, different uh, freedoms and perhaps some more uh, efficiency. That said, I've worked out in, in, uh, in some of the gyms around town since the COVID restrictions. And I got to say, they're doing a great job. And, yeah. and I, do miss, uh, I do miss the kind of going to the gym as well and just putting in headsets and uh, kind of lose yourself there for you know, an hour of just, uh, just doing straight strength training. Yeah, no, I hear that. And you just mentioned about your family too. Tell me about why you think that's important uh, as a family, because your, your wife is active, you're active, your kids are active. How does that, how does that sort of work its way through your family? Yeah, I mean, we try to encourage the active, healthy, balanced lifestyle. And, uh, you know, my eldest plays volleyball. My middle child is in a lot of soccer, very proud of her, uh, proud of them all, obviously, but, uh, you know, they, they, uh, she plays a lot, a lot of soccer, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, which is great. Uh, you know, it's a good balanced sport, I think. And uh, I also love the fact that volleyball and, and the soccer kind of uh, develop a sense of uh, team commitment and team play in addition to being uh, uh, physically active. And then my youngest son uh, plays soccer and hockey, and uh, and he just has a great time. And, of course, you know, all of them it really enjoy it. And I think, you know, the most important thing uh, is they also equally see that uh, my wife and I are also physically active and uh, hopefully we're 
leading by example and, and, uh, and they'll develop equally uh, balanced uh, physically active lifestyles and, and you know collectively together you know we downhill ski I know you know not everyone can do that but it, it is a great family sport together it's uh, it's really allowed us to kind of uh, have fun together and, and, and getting exercise at the same time so it's uh, I think having a healthy family is, is perhaps more important than being healthy yourself. Mm. And for those people looking to try it, we've got our ski hills open this year, so there'll be some staycationing. Yeah. That's the Honorable Dr. Andrew Fury, Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, giving us some insights into his health and wellness routine. I feel like his rowing crew may have a bit more pressure on them next summer if we're able to get back on the pond. Now, when we come back, we'll talk about how our lives have changed with the COVID-19 pandemic here at home including our most recent news that our Atlantic bubble has shrunk. The Premier will share our government's decision to roll back the bubble in hopes of protecting us from the pandemic, which is spreading east, while keeping our economy open. He also shares an update on vaccine trials and what we know so far about how vaccinations will unfold here in the province. We'll be right back after this break. While COVID-19 cases are spiking around the world, here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we've had a relatively small number of cases. A very large part of that is due to the efforts of our citizens, communities, and government public health officials. In hopes of avoiding the challenges that other parts of the country are now facing, Premier Fury and Premier King of PEI have implemented a mandatory 14-day isolation period to travelers entering the province, even from our neighbors in the Atlantic bubble. I asked Premier Fury about why they decided to make these changes and what we need to do as a population to remain safe and take care of one another. Well, let's switch gears a little bit now and let's talk about uh, what's going on with the pandemic because you happened to take over during the middle of the global pandemic, which is a once in a lifetime type event. Right now we've changed some of the, the restrictions. Why was it necessary to kind of shrink our bubble for the time being? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're a bubble in a bubble uh, right now. Um, when we were looking and weighing all the different uh, variables in, the, in other jurisdictions, I think it's important not just to look at the case count, but it's also equally important to look at how the cases are being distributed. So with respect to community spread. So really thought that this pandemic is moving east and we've seen it do so now with increasing cases in some of the other Atlantic provinces. And, you know, we have the added advantage in this case. Uh, it hasn't always been an advantage for us of, of being a, an island and being able to isolate from, uh, from others. And uh, so we need to use whatever uh, tools are in the toolbox right now to uh, try to ensure that we're continuing to live with COVID-19 because there's never going to be a time where there's no COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, but that we have the capacity to contact trace and, and contain outbreaks should they occur when they occur mm -hmm. uh, so that the economy can continue. People can keep going to gyms. People, we don't have to go back into a lockdown. So this was one of the, uh, this is one of the levers that we had. And I, and I felt at this particular time when evaluating uh, the virology uh, uh, of this of COVID-19 in other jurisdictions that it was appropriate to act now. Mm. And, you know, it's not lost on me equally that uh, Dr. Tam said just recently, I'm not sure if it was yesterday or the day before that, you know, the, the sooner you, the longer you, you wait to act, the longer the, the restrictions generally stay in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, Again, it intuitively makes sense because if you overwhelm the contact tracers and the capacity that we have, as we've seen in other jurisdictions like Alberta and, and others in Toronto, that you can't contain it. And, uh, and uh, then you look at, and then you're forced into a lock. The only mechanism you have to contain it mm -hmm. is to lock down. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to prevent a lockdown. We're trying to continue with schools and we've done a great job and Newfoundlanders and Labradorians all deserve a round of applause. I know it hasn't been easy. I know it's been tough and I know people are suffering for COVID fatigue, but everyone just needs to dig a little deeper and, and hold on a little longer and, and 
hopefully we can get through this with our capacity intact to deal with cases should they when they arise and and now that we have this hope for a vaccine that's uh, within our reach so mm -hmm. everyone just needs to dig a little deep for a little longer and i know that's a big ask because there's been a there's been a big ask and a big response already but just to, we just need to hold on a little longer so with being shut down a little bit from the rest or making it more difficult to access does that I think that may create a false sense of security in people. How important is it for us to still follow the hand washing and the social distancing and the mask wearing and all those things? That's incredibly important. I mean, those are, those are the things that have been uh, tried, tested and proven and uh, have shown to limit the spread of the disease. And uh, so it's incredible. You know, we, Dr. Fitzgerald and her team and the government have, have been very aggressive on uh, implementing preventative measures. I think, you know, even recently, we're still seeing other provinces catch up to where we were, you know, three months ago. Hmm. Uh, so it's, it's, I'm very proud of how Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have responded to those measures, but we need to continue to do it. Hmm. Uh, continue to wear a mask, continue to social distance, and please avoid the temptation to gather in large gatherings. Hmm. You know, we're doing, we're trying to do all of these things so that the economy can keep going, businesses can keep open, uh, and schools can keep open. So I, I, I know and appreciate the temptation, especially with COVID fatigue, to have large gatherings, especially as, as the season approaches. But we need to do our bit to just resist that temptation and, and for the greater good. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of how Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have answered the call today. That's right. And, and, you know, there, you said there was a bit of hope because the vaccines are, there's more trials coming out every day. Canada is committed to buying uh, apparently 10 times even what we may need as a country. But what will the Newfoundland response be when there's, when there's an opportunity to have access to a vaccine? Of course, we're formulating that right now, and uh, that'll be, be based on public health decision. But it certainly will be one that's triaged and stratified according to risk initially so that we protect the most vulnerable in the society, healthcare providers, uh, high-risk populations, uh, and, and, and move from there. And, and again, this will all depend, as you suggested, Canada has rightfully, in my opinion, bet on all the developers. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully as these uh, vaccines become available, there's not just one, there's three, and then the amount of vaccine that Canada has access to is, is tripled or quadrupled, depending on and the regulatory environment. So, uh, you know, uh, we're not there yet and it will take time. It's not like, you know, January 1 or I, I saw in a media outlet earlier today that vaccinations are likely to begin in the second week of December in the United States. It still needs to be approved in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it will take time uh, to get everyone uh, vaccinated, obviously, but we focus on, on the most vulnerable in the population. So, because that's the other way to flatten the curve, you know, that we want to make sure that we're protecting the ones that would override the healthcare system capacity uh, should we have massive outbreak. Right. And for those people that may be concerned about the safety of the vaccine, can you quickly explain the, the amount sure. of rigor that Canada has? Because we, we're, we're one of the most rigorous countries in the world when it comes to that. Sure. And, and so is the FDA, to be fair, to the United yep. States and our southern neighbors and, and the UK. You know, the, the vaccines have gone through the phases of clinical trials. And, and every time there's a, there's a clinical trial, whether it be a medication or a, or a vaccine, there's a series of, of, of phases that you must go through in order to uh, be uh, available to the general public. Um, and when they do those, there's, it's treated with serious, uh, significant scientific rigor and reporting side effect profiles. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, some drugs, some pharmaceuticals, for example, never make it to market because this, the side effect profile is, is too large. But in this case, uh, the side effect, I, I'm not privy to all the internal, uh, you know, findings of Pfizer and Moderna and uh, AstraZeneca, but certainly it's encouraging that they're not uh, saying that there are massive side effect profiles. Mm. And, and certainly in if there, there will be side effects, like there's side effects to waking up in the morning and walking to the bathroom, you know, there's side effects to every action we take in life, but hopefully the side effects are uh, such that the benefits of the vaccine are far, far greater than any side effect profile that would be associated with the, with the vaccine. I, you know, the, there are side effects to all vaccines and uh, sometimes that is uh, 
introduced in a social debate that is generally unfounded and uh, and hopefully that has been put to rest by the by the current literature and i generally not generally always encourage everyone to get the vaccines uh, that they, that their children should get and that they themselves should get in order to protect them, not just themselves but others in the community that's right. Well, we had Minister Hagee on just a few weeks ago talking about the flu shot campaign and how easy it is now with the province and all the programs you guys have put in place to help uh, with that as well. But we're winding down here. But uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for taking the time today. Is there anything you'd like to say to the population of Newfoundland Labrador when it comes to a little message for their health before we leave? Yeah, of course. You know, in these times of COVID-19, it, it's easy to... Uh, to, ne- to neglect both your physical health and, and mental health. I encourage you all to uh, to become healthy. Uh, physically healthy is one of the is one of the measures that we've seen through the research that can actually protect against any uh, any detrimental effects of, of COVID nineteen. The healthier you are, the better you would survive the virus should you get it. So look at adapting a, a healthy lifestyle, uh, including a balanced diet and exercise, and please uh, please get your flu shots. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today. I know you're a busy guy, so I'm going to let you get back to your job, but, but really appreciate you taking the time today. Take care. And uh, to everyone out there, uh, stay safe, uh, look after each other, and look after yourselves. I'd like to thank the Premier for taking the time to talk to us today. We all know how busy he is with the challenges we face in the province right now, but I think the fact that he emphasized the importance of our health here at home should tell us something. Now, he holds an interesting perspective as both our premier and a physician, and he also lives by example when it comes to a balanced lifestyle. His message about us doing what we can to maintain and improve our physical and mental health during the pandemic really rang through with me, and I hope it did with you as well. Well, that's our show this week. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.